down two core components. Uh, basically, how do we operate better tomorrow than we did yesterday? And then how do we bridge the gap towards our future capabilities and, and unlocking a lot of those needs? But excited to be here and talk more about uh, kind of our effect within COVID-19. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. Uh, if I could pass over um, to yourself, Harshad. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, this is Harshad Kanvinde. I'm a practice leader, uh, lead strategy and supply chain consulting practice at Slalom Consulting. Uh, Slalom is a business and technology consulting firm, a global firm, uh, about 8,000 people. And uh, we serve clients in many sectors, including retail, CPG, uh, aerospace, technology, auto, uh, and so on. So uh, glad to be here. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Thanks, Harshad. Uh, and over to you, Pedro. Perhaps you could uh, initially start by kicking us off also on you know, the lessons that you've learned over this period of time um, uh, and you know what people should be kind of looking out for. Hi, everybody. Uh, it was a pleasure to be with you guys and sharing our point of view. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Jamie, for for the invitation, uh, say hello also for my colleagues. Um, so I'm the operations director for Alpergatas uh, in uh, EMEA region. Uh, Alpergatas is uh, the largest footwear company manufacturer in uh, South America. The most known uh, brand of the, the old group is uh, Avayana's flip flops. And mainly the, the experience that we have here in EMEA is confined to the um, flip flops Avayana's. Um, so if I could start and, and following a little bit the, the, the first, uh, the first uh, highlights that's, that uh, we have learned uh, about this thing that everybody's calling to be the new normal. Uh, the main four things that uh, we have learned, uh, I, I, I will split in four. The first one is the micro, the micro environment, the micro atmosphere that is touching more as, as individuals and, and society. So we think that we need to be prepared for a massive unemployment that will lead uh, social tension and, and conflicts. Um, I'm also a little bit scared about all the geopolitics because uh, all the closed borders that we have now won't be, um, won't be uh, open, um, short, that's my point of view. So uh, I don't know how the, the geopolitics puzzle will, will uh, will lead in, in the future. Um, we need to be prepared, of course, that the, the new laws on privacy uh, that we need to comply with we will take also um, an impact on our day living. And all of these that I'm, uh, I'm talking about, this uh, global atmosphere, the okay, uh, all of these uh, will more anxiety and depression. Uh, I think that uh, resuming what this micro environment is, is, is transforming, that we are realizing now um, the importance the, the importance of being an identity more than a job. Um, so this is the, the thing that I consider one of the four pillars. The second one that the new normal is bringing is absolutely the explosion of the e-commerce. So I think that uh, those ones that were a little bit more traditional on switching channel, in these just uh, seven, eight weeks, we just realized that how the e-commerce is boosting. Uh, we know uh, that uh, from even in our reality in Alpregatas and also for some peers and from some news that, uh, that we are reading, that some projects of the e-commerce are being put forward in about one year. The third point that I would like to, 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 to mention is about the digital adoption. I think that the business trips, uh, the, the, the way that you are, uh, that we have the traditional business ways, uh, we will change drastically. Uh, our lifestyles, we will change drastically. And also the way that we are working. Um, so I'm based in, uh, in Madrid where the, the European head office are. So this is the seven week for us now in confinement. We are remote uh, working for seven weeks now. And all of this has been changing a lot uh, our habits. And to be, to be honest with you guys, I was not expecting for instance, one of the most traditional uh, sectors like the ELF to see the e-health, uh, so seeing doctors giving uh, appointments uh, electronically, and that, for me, tells me a lot. And uh, at last, uh, uh, for instance, uh, that I would like to, 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 to reinforce on the new normal is the customer engagement. What we have been uh, looking and also in uh, Avayanas uh, on a very, very positive way is the customer engagement with the brand, 
um, through the social media. So it's not now the, the commercial, but also the actions that we are taking, the, the, the way that we are speaking, the, the things that we are doing as a company, uh, as human beings that we are in the, in the, the organization, and being also more social, more humanized companies. And I think the customer is engaging to that on a different different way. So this is the thing that I would like to highlight as a, as a new normal, so for sure that we will have time for the Q&A to give you a little bit what we are doing and the main challenges. One of Ayana's, what are the, the main things that, uh, that we are facing that we have changed uh, so far? So what are the, the main points? First, I would say, that our main concern, uh, not just all in EMEA, but worldwide, in, uh, in all over the world, and all the, the headquarters that we have in, in Brazil, is number one priority is take care about our people. And when we're talking about take care about our people, it's not just financial and doing the effort that we don't have layoffs, but also um, keep them active, integrated, and motivated in these, in these moments. So this is our first one priority. The second one is um, protect the business and protecting the, the cash generation. So we need to be sustainable uh, also as a company. Um, other thing we have from the very beginning, we have um, uh, took uh, the decision uh, to, to form a steering committee of the COVID-19, where we meet every single morning, half an hour, where we take the fast decisions for the any any issues that uh, that come up on a daily basis. So that steering committee um, is the, the leading uh, of the company on, on the measures that we need to articulate. And we need to communicate with transparency to our people, to our key uh, uh, partners, to our customers. I think also this is one of the things that, that we are caring about is communication with clarity. And the last uh, that I would like to highlight as a Vianas, uh, as an Alpargatas, is the community mission that we are taking care. So in Brazil, in our factories, uh, following other good examples, we are producing masks to, to the hospitals. Um, we have converted our production lines to do hospital footwear. And through the Alpargatas Institute, we have been supporting some hospitals in Brazil, also here in Madrid, where he is the, the, the MAI headquarters, uh, and also in, in Italy, uh, one of the biggest uh, markets that, that we have, and supporting uh, with donations for these, um, for these people, for these heroes, uh, to have um, uh, facilities uh, to, to buy what is uh, missing uh, nowadays. Um, I would take another two or three minutes, if you allow me, guys. Uh, when we see the, the the theme of this of this uh, webinar, that is the implications of inventory planning, sourcing, and procurement, um, and were three questions. Okay, that I could see is like, what are the impacts that we have on the import costs and margins? How do we mitigate risks, and how we are changing the demand planning? Well, that is very interesting because. Uh, as, as operations director, I run uh, demand planning, logistics, customer service. So demand planning is directly through through my my uh, my my team. And to be honest, uh, when uh, people is telling me what we are doing, what the the database, what figures, how we can recalculate, guys, it's too tough because we never been through such a complex puzzle like this. So all the historical data, all the CO, the SOPs, all the, the, the algorithms, all the information, big data that we have is such on a different scenario, such a different pattern that we don't, we don't have anything that could follow us um, or give us any clue on, uh, on the future, at least for us. So what we are doing, we are basically, we are protecting our inventory. And what that means, that means that uh, we estimate to lose between 30 to 50% of sales this, this year. We are very seasonal brand, as you may think, on flip-flops and summertime. Um, so uh, being responsible, being um, sustainable, uh, being also uh, protective cash, what we are doing, we are not flushing out, we are not putting as a discount or our discount. Uh, we are protecting our inventory and we are keeping this inventory and we will 
carry the most of the items for the next season okay um so a part of that we need to take risks on forecasting like never ever before uh, we are uh, conscious that uh, these are different times and we will need to come out of our comfort uh, zones we need to be also open to our customers and share what is their expectations integrate their expectations and be transparent on on the stock position on the purchasing on the order execution and trying to avoid the, the major attrictions on these difficult times um, as a company overall we are uh, focus that our production, uh, we should carry on, all, as I said, this, this inventory, maintain the inventory, not flush out and producing from the scratch. But also in our factories, we need to protect those products that have higher margins. We need, as I said, we need to be sustainable now and in the future. This is one of the our pillars in our in our core values. So we are reassessing, re-adopting the, the the products uh, and just producing those ones that offer higher margins we also think about the postponement strategy um and at the end uh, regarding the the cost margins and impacts i would say yes this will have a huge uh, impact on 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 cost margins and why is that because of course we need to 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 think about um, not just we avianas operatives but uh, but uh, generally i think that we need to look at uh, alternative sources of of uh, procurement of production alternative factories alternative countries um even the transport network is changing um i'm sure that we will need to bring more by air rather than than sea and we need to pay for securing capacity on uh, on those on those uh, options and we are prepared to also to do some order fragmentation on the factory and also from our from our customers also uh, we are already uh, knowing that the new health and safety measures that we need to comply with we will drop the production productivity so at the end the sum is very 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 linear is very easy to find out that is of course the margins we will um, drop last how do we mitigate risks i think that generally speaking uh, not just for us but for all other companies it depends a little bit on the on the level of each one of the companies which one of you uh, how, how you are prepared uh, for for the contingency plans some companies are a little bit more advanced on contingency plans than others um we are not so well prepared that caught us um, very very uh, uh, at surprise so the things that we are eventually uh, could say that i could say is diversification of sourcing uh, reducing the, the the dependence on single suppliers um, and develop a uh, relationship with the key partners uh, for the it or the the partnership sharing volumes and invest like no other in the tools uh, of demand planning and control towers to give us the most fine-tuned information the the most um look like like a crystal ball that everybody would like to have now so that's that's my my point of view thank you thanks so much pedro i really appreciate it really really interesting stuff you know, I've personally got a couple of follow-up questions, which I'm sure we can get to at the Q&A at the end. But I think, um, apologies to some of the audience who might have um, been on hold for the first minute. I think there might, might have been some folks that missed off the first minute or so. So just to kind of let anyone know um, who's in that bracket, at the end, we'll be doing a kind of a Q&A. And so when you're listening to our, our esteemed presenters today, make sure you're, you're entering any questions that you have and we'll try to get to uh, as many of them as possible. But in the meantime, uh, I'll hand over to Alex Wheeler from Target. Awesome, thank you. I'll uh, figure out my screen here in a second. We all can see that slide. You all see that, good? Yeah, that's perfect, Alex. Awesome, great. So, Again, thanks for having me over here. Um, I'll say hello slash good morning from sunny Minneapolis. It's finally above about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so we're all happy over here. Um, 
And so, I, you know, I really try to simplify a little bit of what we're going to talk about today at, at a total target level, and then we can get into food and beverage too, specifically within my area. I guess for those who, who are, aren't aware, so Target, again, large retail in the United States, uh, we're approaching about 2,000 stores and are also digital online, about 350,000 team members kind of day-to-day -day operations, and then we get up into 450,000 at peak and kind of all across major retail sectors, right? So apparel, home, general merch, food and beverage, and essentials. So really try to run the gamut here. Um, and then within COVID-19 specifically, I would say, you know, two key buckets that I would all I'll talk through, which is obviously a change in demand, and and really the month of March was our uh, our big change in, in how we operated there, and then I think we're rolling into April and looking forward, you know, our key learnings to what we've seen both from the operation so far, but then also what we're seeing from our team members and everything else. So uh, I think like everybody else, you know, targets a lot of uh, large disruption in demand now through some of the the comp numbers on the side of there for March. So again, we were up you know over 20% as a total company. 50% uh, more than food and beverage and essentials, and and then a, a, a long kind of deterioration within apparel and accessories. Um, you know, so again, driving top line sales is always a good thing until it's a, it's a tough mix on on the operating margin. And so, you know, really what we've seen is is a huge deterioration within the apparel sector. So things that people don't need on a day to day basis relative to let's say the food and essentials that I think we've seen all around the news and the and the run on the market and things like toilet paper and, and all food really in total. Um, and from there, you know, so the other kind of big driver within the cost margin was, you know, how do we support our team members in our communities? And so, you know, we've spent, you know, I think it was $300 million or more just in the month of March alone to to help our team members specifically, uh, you know, trying to be good stewards of our environment and, and make sure that they feel safe and, and in control of their lives relative to the work at hand. Um, and equally so, we saw a huge demand change within uh, how our guests interact with us. And so, you know, we talk about the shift to digital. We were, you know, we were prepared for an increase, but I think, you know, even just in this first few weeks of April, we're seeing almost 300% increase within digital on a business that was already growing, uh, you know, almost exponentially. And so as we look into those those pieces, what we're really understanding or trying to, to put a mark on is how do we do more profitably? I think there's, you know, different uh, views within the industry on, on how we shift that, that potential long-term and, you know, whether it's, um, trying to be strategic around positioning inventory within our distribution centers, I think, uh, or in the stores, um, or even using kind of same-day delivery services. All of those things become a, an optimization, you know, conversation, and one that you know my team is very focused on and understanding both, you know, how do we just get through this peak, but then how do we look towards the future uh, and what that means for us. And so, you know, I've seen a really heavy reliance, especially on that same-day delivery service. So I feel very fortunate uh, that we were able to acquire that that capability and build that muscle over the last couple of years. Um, and then from there, it's really how do we prioritize that that position of inventory? Like I said, relative to you know having almost 2,000 stores, there's a lot of ways for us to break down that inventory and and try to get it right. And so we're seeing a really uh, um, you know a huge impact within the the highly controlled you know cities that have seen large impacts, but then also a very consistent flow you know within our suburbs and kind of non-urban non environments to our, our drive-up services. So, you know, people who can order online, secure the inventory, come at their convenience to get the, the inventory. And it's put a strain, but also a really good understanding for us on how might this look like in the future. So, that, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more on the key learnings. Um, and I think, you know, it's really important to talk about, too, what we've paused in this meantime. So, you know, we've, we've put a lot of effort and understanding into expansion within the urban spaces of our environment. And, and so I think it was both cool, but also interesting to see, you know, our leadership take the stance on while we tackle this, this capability to help our guests in the short run, we're also going to be mindful of what we're expanding or stopping in, in the medium to long term. And so you think about things like uh, expanding remodels of our stores and things along those lines. Um, you know, we're, we're taking that stance to allow us to pivot and accelerate things that we know will be impactful again within the fulfillment space um, and also getting closer to our guests within the cities that are largely impacted, um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations around, um, you know, how do we pivot ourselves to be more applicable and more um, quickly there for our guests within the spaces where they can't go out of, of their building. So I think those were all, you know, big demand changes. And so as we pivot towards kind of learnings, and again, I, you know, I put down on top, the bottom corner there are, are kind of quarter numbers. So again, we're seeing a lot of improvements within our spaces and the mix is getting better day over day. I think within the month of April, you're starting to see positive across all businesses, which is huge. 
Um, and so again, I, and I, I'd stress that fulfillment is working, right? I, our ability to well position our stores as our first line of defense and making sure that they're capable of getting things to our guests very quickly has been astronomically important. Um, and then honestly, the, one of the cool kind of surprising moments for us was the ability for our, our, our the flexibility of our team members, right? So when we close down the things that don't allow for social distancing, so you think about bellies or bakeries or, you know, even our Starbucks team members and able to pivot them into the workforce um, to maintain their, you know, what they need from a jobs perspective, but also help us to maintain our, our ability to service our guests has been huge and, and very impactful for us. Um, I will say, you know, a little bit of a joke, but uh, not really is, you know, we were, were kind of lucky with our timing with Easter. So Easter is frankly one of our biggest peaks of the year. And so as we approached it within the month of March, uh, we got a little bit lucky on being heavy in inventory within spaces that, um, you know, allowed us to be there for our guests. And so now the, the pivot and the turn is to understand how do we get back in. Um, you know, if I, you know, speaking on, I'll say on a personal front is the visibility is always lacking relative to what you want to be end to end. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of focus on trying to answer really important questions on when will we be back in stock, you know, to what items and how do we do that? Questions that we haven't had to ask in the past because, you know, when, you're, when you are a big enough footprint and, and enough inventory levels, you can miss here and there. And so for the first time, I would say in a while, we've been really pushed and stressed to understand, you know, in certain markets, how quickly can we recover? How, how do we position ourselves to do that? Uh, you know, having conversations around how do we prioritize certain items and get very heavy on the ones that the guests need relative to the other, you know, we call it the tail um, that isn't necessarily as important in this moment. And so really trying to understand that. And those are things that we will take, you know, out of this particular crisis or situation and, and frankly will help us accelerate our business in the future. Um, and then I think it's really the last piece that I would say is a key learning that we haven't um, done quite well yet is how do we define recovery? How do we define that moment in time where we can pivot from truly just executing the crisis to starting to unlock again projects that either we had paused, projects that we need now to accelerate again to be there for our guests um, or our team members. Uh, how do we learn from those those initial learnings and really pivot our business moving forward, not just for, again from a you know sales and operations perspective, but also from our team members' perspective. And so, you know, what I'd summarize as we look towards kind of May and beyond you know, three key things that, you know, I, I would say I and, and our teams are really focused on. One, I think, it, and it, it's everybody, is how do we balance the, the long hours? Um, you know, we've, we've had a, a little bit of running joke on, I think our productivity as a team has gone up over 100% from this, this crisis. Um, and what it, what it really means is we are hard pressed to blend, you know, hours off and hours on. And so I think for about a month there, I don't know if half my team took a single day off, um, but on the flip side of that, We've built things uh, to allow us to, to now take some time off as we you know, accelerate that and, and really balance the, the automation of those tools and resources relative to the, the manual nature that we were in the beginning. I think two, it's uh, really how do we accelerate those key initiatives like I talked about. So when we talk about sustainable models of fulfillment and how do we replenish and build a better network plan to support any crisis, crisis let alone something like this again in the future, you know, we're taking a hard look at what does that look like for our guests. Um, you know, I think we as a, as a food and beverage network um, are capable of delivering every single day of the week uh, and frankly 24 seven if needed. Uh, but I think this has really put a stress on, you know, our old normals and what we thought were our capacities have now almost doubled. Um, and that was only in a month's time. So you can imagine what we could do over time, you know, in the, in the years to come. And then I think the last piece again is remaining build, uh, sorry, uh, vigilant on how those guest demands are shifting and what that means for us longer term. So. You know, a lot of my focus over the next probably year uh, uh, remains that, that fulfillment methodology, especially in urban centers. When we talk about uh, the, the expansion of that and, you know, we're, we're really new in the game, um, on, especially on the food and beverage side, I think as a total enterprise, Target has done a good job to, to get into fulfillment. But as we talk about food and beverage, you know, we're, we're still in certain, only certain markets within time controlled space. And as we talk about cities like New York and LA and Chicago that are highly impacted by this, it becomes that much more evident on, on the work that's in front of us to, to be better positioned to pivot to that. So those are the high level remarks again, I think similar to Pedro, I'm happy to answer questions as we get to the Q&A. Um, just wanna get the high level thoughts on Target. So thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for sharing your thoughts. Um,
Again, um, just a reminder, I'm sure the audience will have a bunch of questions for you, for yourself and the other guys, so please do, please do um, send them in. Uh, I think what came through there is the kind of the positive um, outcomes of this period, and I think it's, it's important for, for everyone to focus on that, you know, where we're going through these times, how can we position ourselves to come out of that? So that came through loud and clear, so thanks for that, Alex. Um, but uh, I'll now hand over to, to Harshad. Thanks, Jamie. Um, let me uh, share my screen real quick. So, uh, as ev everyone knows, uh, this uh, disruption has been unprecedented, right? So, shocks on both the supply side as well as demand side that that rarely happens. Uh, what we are seeing is first when the uh, when the virus started in China, there were some supply concerns, and then uh, as we went into lockdown, uh, obviously the demand dried up. Uh, we, are, we are kind of in a unique position at Slalom, so serving several customers in several different uh, industries, uh, the implications of demand disruptions and supply disruptions and the time element when, when those disruptions hit the most uh, was kind of different in different, uh, different sectors. So personally, uh, we have uh, clients in aerospace, clients in CPG, retail, uh, retail technology, uh, healthcare and so on. So we are seeing quite different uh, uh, implications, uh, supply chain implications, as well as how people are uh, responding to those, those different things. And uh, we are in the position to uh, participate in that, uh, in that, in that mitigation, uh, mitigation task. Uh, from the slalom standpoint, we have about 8,500 team members globally. And, and uh, as a company, we are, uh, as Alex and Pedro also mentioned from their respective company standpoint, our first and foremost focus uh, is always on helping our people and making sure that emotionally, financially, we are we are all uh, well taken care of. So we are doing that. And, and then the second most important thing is how can we innovate and be creative uh, as our clients struggle through the, uh, through the demand supply disruptions? How can we come through for them? So there are, I think the good thing out of all this, what we are seeing, um, a lot has been said. I think Alex talked about that. Uh, Pedro talked about that. Those same issues we are we are seeing all all across on inventory and sourcing and so on. But I think there is a silver lining uh, that we are seeing people coming through and and uh, building creative solutions um, to uh, to to tackle the situation that we are we are currently in. Uh, we are also learning uh, uh, the things that we we thought impossible before. So for example, remote working and <laughs> And, and still being able to uh, collaborate very effectively internally as well as with client teams and so on that's that's happened so we are stretching stretching the limits that we didn't uh, didn't know we have the capability to uh, uh, working remotely using the digital tools and so on um, the across the different industries the commonalities that we are seeing uh, from the supply chain standpoint what's becoming uh, more important or or getting highlighted as the important factor is the uh, is the visibility and overall agility in supply chains so we have been working with several customers uh, even before covid-19 started a uh, lot of a lot of investments were going into digital transformation digital initiatives and the uh, uh, what we are seeing now is that some some clients were ahead of some other clients in terms of their digital maturity and and that's showing up as people start thinking about uh, inventory, as people start thinking about sourcing and other disruptions and how they react to that. So I'll talk a little bit about, about that, that the, um, the uh, implications that we are seeing in terms of supply chain agility and, and, and visibility. So uh, what's becoming uh, very clear, uh, COVID-19 massive disruption, uh, we can't predict these kind of disruptions. There have been several other disruptions in the past and there will be several others in, in, in future, hopefully not as massive as COVID-19, but uh, that's just the reality of the reality of the game, right? So uh, uh, what's becoming clear is disruptions will happen. You can't really predict it. How can you be more, more uh, creative in responding to those disruptions? I think as Alex mentioned, uh, the first four weeks of being locked down, so this is week seven for us in Seattle, uh, Washington. Uh, but as the first four or five weeks, uh, it was uh, super focused on firefighting, that getting the war room set up, getting the, uh, getting the command center set up so that we can make the decisions pretty quickly around inventory, uh, think about how, uh, how to forecast demand and so on. 
or how to move the suppliers and how so so uh, i see that uh, companies across industries are are getting out of that firefighting mode a little bit or, or there is some stability some control over now the mechanisms are set up how to do the firefighting and uh, now the thinking is shifting slightly toward what happens next how to get prepared so some of the uh, for example i think alex mentioned it some of the initiatives that were put on pause for last uh, month month and a half people are starting to think about how do you restart those or how do you rethink uh, some of those initiatives and visibility is the center centerpiece in that and visibility not in not only in terms of uh, where my inventory is in which channel and how to move it uh, but also about consumer demand and and how can i how can i be ahead of uh, ahead of that game how can i forecast the demand and on the supply side as well uh, how do i know more uh, at the more granular and reliable level uh, the supply supplier performance and not only my tier 1 suppliers but tier 2 tier 3 suppliers that what's happening with them uh, how liquid they are uh, can they can they meet the demand in future and any disruptions that may happen in my sub tier supply chain how is that going to impact impact me so all that visibility end to end visibility right from the suppliers to the uh, to the consumer that's getting getting a lot of attention and uh, and folks are uh, rethinking their previous digital initiatives to to gear more toward uh, the goal of increasing visibility so that i can react uh, i can react quickly so as you can see on the screen so visibility uh, uh, as a means to an end the end is uh, how can i make that visibility use that visibility to predict the scenarios that may happen in future and take dynamic decisions so that i can i can respond fast and not uh, there is no uh, it's not just the negative connotation when i say faster response it's not just crisis happens and i react faster so that i can survive but through this crisis, I think what's uh, happening, as for example, Pedro mentioned, uh, there is a surge in demand on the, on the online channels. How can I use that kind of opportunity better and respond faster to those emerging opportunities as well? So I think uh, uh, it again goes back to how can I increase my visibility in my network so that I can take all those, all those decisions uh, faster and in a more agile fashion. Uh, and this is this is common across aerospace, technology, retail, consumer products. So I think uh, the, the flavor of it is slightly different in each industries, but uh, but the visibility need for visibility is very common. Um, one thing is also becoming super clear. I was just uh, talking to, uh, to a Fortune 500 CPG client we have uh, here in, uh, in in the states, and uh, the, this whole notion of visibility is important. Everyone gets that uh, agility in supply chain is important. Uh, there is uh, this uh, renewed focus on understanding that digital backbone uh, is going to be super important to gain that visibility, uh, right from the supplier mapping to the uh, to understanding the consumers better. So how how should we rethink our digital investments? And and to be to be quite frank, I think uh, what we had seen for last four or five years, uh, people have been investing in in, in digital. Uh, but that focus, I think no transformation really happens unless there is emergency, right? So if people intuitively get that, I think uh, COVID-19 uh, is proving to be that catalyst for accelerating digital, that how can I rethink digital investments that we have been doing so that uh, so that it's focused on the right right things that will make my supply chains agile. That's that's the kind of theme that's emerging across different different companies that we interact with. Uh, another thing that uh, that coming to the forefront is how do I balance my investments? Because what uh, last six weeks, seven weeks have shown, uh, when a disruption like COVID-19 is happening, I do need to do everything in my capacity, manually, digitally, whichever means possible, to uh, to survive and to serve my customers and to uh, to to make sure that the lights are on uh, for the broader community as well as for my employees and and so on. But then how do I make sure that uh, I don't only focus on that and I use the learnings that are coming out of COVID-19 to make sure that we are investing in future so that if something like this happens again, which it, it will, uh, I'm better prepared. So how do you think about the investment prioritization? Uh, that's another topic of discussions that, that uh, coming up 
coming up at multiple uh, different uh, different clients. Uh, finally, I think the last last pieces that I want to uh, want to talk about is uh, underlying this. I think uh, companies who were customer obsessed and who had uh, distributed uh, authority in in their who were believing in their teams and the innovation was happening at the individual team levels. Uh, generally speaking, market wide, sector wide, we, we see that those companies are faring better. And then there is that renewed understanding that how customer obsession, how should we think about that? Everyone talks about customer obsession, but I think uh, the flavor is different in each companies. Uh, so there is there is that renewed focus that how should I tie back everything, all the visibility initiatives, all the all the digital initiatives back to the customer obsession and then working backward from the customers. Some companies are doing better than the others, but there is that focus. Uh, and how do I empower my teams to, to do better? As Alex mentioned, I think everyone is pulling uh, more than 100% of their weight. Uh, slalom is not an exception. Uh, uh, in our consulting business, we are seeing that as well, that the, the, the normal rules don't apply, that I, I wanted to do this particular kind of thing uh, and i have done that particular kind of thing uh, in the regular times but this is this is different and everyone is doing whatever they can to help our customers help the community help help the uh, slalom business but how do i uh, enable that uh, in a structured fashion so that people feel empowered to innovate at their local levels and and solve the problems at the local level so uh, so they, uh, and it's it's a very positive thing coming out of this. I think there is that renewed focus on team empowerment, uh, which uh, which we see across the client. So I'll stop there. I think I'm much more interested uh, in the in the Q and A uh, Q and A session, and we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. Fantastic, Harsha. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, uh, and excellent insights. Uh, as ever. So now we've got uh, an opportunity for some Q&A and I've jotted down some questions myself, but we've also had a bunch come through um, from you folks in the audience. Um, and there, there, there's, the first one I came to was addressed to, to yourself, Alex, um, but you know this can, I guess, be expanded to, to everyone. It was around, you know, are you considering investment in automation solutions for fulfillment? So I'll direct that to yourself first, but I'll be interested to see the other guys' perspectives on investment in automation, generally speaking, too. Sorry, can you repeat? Sorry, it broke up the first half of that. Can you just repeat that real quick? Yeah, sure. So essentially the question is, are you considering investment in automation solutions for fulfillment? Got you. Yeah, you know, I think... Um... You know, the way we kind of tackle that solution, I would say, is twofold. So, you know, from a, and I guess it depends on if you're talking automation from a, like a systems perspective or a physical movement perspective, right? Um, but I think the key there is more our projects are kind of independent on what they're worth to us and how we'll go after it. And then the automation is kind of the second piece of that equation. So um, I think that's, uh, it may be different than some people tackle it, but we look at it as a, what do we need to be able to support our guests just first and foremost um, and then if within that space or the ability of that to be profitable is automation a question or a solution is kind of the the second tier um i, I would i'd be remiss not to say that we absolutely look at automation you know our our food buildings as i said today are highly automated relative to I'll say the average part of the industry um but I, it's not necessarily a requirement for our future and, and Pedro, what are your thoughts on that? Are you seeing automation investment across the industry generally increasing? And yourselves, uh, is it something that you're considering from a full perspective, but also in other areas of supply chain too? I, I think honestly here is depending on each one case. It's, it's very uh, hard to find uh, one, one answer that uh, one size fits all. I think that each one of us needs to, to, to look what are the priorities on, on our specific case on automation uh, is, is not on our minds. Uh, I think that the investment, as I said before, is towards the, the thinking the, um, what Ardas was just mentioning, is the, the, the customer obsession and how we can, from outside to inside point of view, how we can exit that, that, that customer, also giving the visibility and, and boosting the e-commerce. The, the so I think that's our our um, our investments now are, are 
fully fully focused on the digital e-commerce rather than automatic. But uh, once again, uh, it depends on uh, each one. For us, automation was never uh, a way to be more competitive in the in the market or boosting the customer service. Fantastic. Thanks, Pedro. So we, we have a, a, another interesting uh, question. Um, and so, Harshad, if you could uh, maybe uh, have a first stab at this. And it was around um, innovation. Um, so specifically, the question was whether we're seeing social impacts from innovation at the, mo at the moment or are investments purely around profitability or indeed you know, retaining uh, margins and mitigating against cost at the moment? Or is there that kind of social um, and sustainable upside that you're seeing as well? I think I would I would say that um, uh, the overall understanding in the across the companies that sustainability and profitability are not two separate things. I think I think it's it's uh, uh, it's interlinked, right? So uh, how well your communities do and how well your uh, your overall uh, because your customers are in your community uh, most of the times and and uh, delivering the value to the customers in a sustainable fashion uh, it's important and it's linked to the profitability and the long-term success of the business so overall across the industries we see that there is uh, there is focus on that and there is more and more increasing understanding understanding of that fact and um, uh, uh, most of the innovation efforts are are not purely focused on profitability um, I, I would I would take uh, I mean I uh, uh, came from uh, for lack of better terms I think uh, having worked at Amazon had had made uh, tremendous influence on on my thinking personally professionally and so on and I think uh, uh, everything starts with the customer right then that same philosophy we adopt at uh, slalom as well I think it goes back to your earlier question about automation as well that it doesn't start with automation it does it starts with the customer need both from the pain point standpoint as well as the opportunity standpoint so you're always inventing on the customer's behalf customers are in your community so so you can't really separate sustainability of the of the overall societal good uh, and 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 the profitability of your business if you decouple that uh, it, it doesn't doesn't result into the long term um, long-term success and uh, thankfully i think uh, we we see uh, more and more understanding uh, understanding of that fact i'm sure that being in seattle uh, kind of um, i'm a little biased but most of the companies we serve in the seattle market definitely have that have that kind of thinking Fantastic, thank you. And, and I'm interested to get your perspectives on this too, Pedro. When you were talking, you mentioned sustainability a couple of times. So I'll be interested to see the extent to which social impact, broadly speaking, uh, is a criteria for which um, innovation in investment happens uh, within your business. Um, sure, I think that we need to be sustainable. The, the, the customer is very well informed nowadays. So if we say normally, even before the, this crisis, that we need to be sustainable is one of the, the axles that we have in our mission, in our values, that we need to be sustainable, sustainable, sustainable. So if we do not take now and react accordingly, the customer uh, will query himself, ourselves, saying what the hell you were doing and she, things didn't, don't really match. So that's why for us it is important to not flesh out stock, not just, it's not just a financial point of view, huh? it's, it's because we, we don't need to, 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 to buy more raw material, we don't need to buy uh, more uh, transports, fuel, uh, CO2, whatever, you need to preserve what we have so far that at the end did not uh, reach the market. Um, so as I said before, I think that is also one, one reason to be to be sustainable. But let me go back to here to innovation because I think that is one of the key points here. I think that uh, all the crisis brings or should bring innovation, okay? The crisis is, is, uh, is pushing us to, to make uh, impossibles. And um, I know that it depends a lot on the sector that you are, on the well that prepared that you have, the, your financial position. It also depends if you are in a sector that leaving this crisis will be more a curve like a new rather than an L. But I think, I think that if you are uh, 
uh, lucky to be in a company that can have some money to invest on um, on innovation, um, yes, will be a source of growth, a source of differentiation. So I think that uh, luckily uh, I'm not in a, in the company uh, that is measured now looking for cutting costs on the operational. Uh, of course, we need to pay the cash, as I said, but uh, those ones that are capable capable to reserve some cash to invest on innovation for sure that will be one step ahead after after the crisis perfect thank you thanks for sharing um a question uh, has just come in um for yourself alex um and it's around your thinking and process around safety concerns for fulfillment of course um there are folks really on the front lines of these things and you know some of us are lucky enough to you know, work in offices or at least in spare bedrooms or things like that at the moment. And so this is a really important concern for many. And so Alex, what is your um, thinking around safety when it comes to fulfillment um, and what's the target approach? Yeah, no, I appreciate yeah. the question. Um, you know, I'll put the caveat out there that I'm not as close to this particular piece as probably some of my peers within the company, but I'll say for my you know outsider looking in within the company there's kind of two pieces that i would focus on is is one there's the physical aspect right so we've done um a huge lift on making sure that our frontline team members are capable of having you know physical barriers whether it's masks or just general protective equipment um you know directing to make sure that we keep the limiting number of people in our stores and in the distance within that and then i think there's also the mental aspect and so you know one thing i've i've been very happy to see from and exactly to your point on, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to sit in my house and do my work, but I have many friends that they don't have that capability. And, you know, to see our, our online, our core leadership kind of make the call on, you know, the mental aspect of if you feel unsafe, if you feel like you're susceptible, if you have someone at home that is susceptible, you can take the time you need and we're not going to hurt you from a, you know, pay perspective or, or a standing perspective has been hugely important. I um, mean, you know, I've got a couple of friends who also work within our district distribution centers who have the same mentality they've got you've got team members who take this time um you know whether in the fulfillment or punishment space and want to be there for their community they want to be moving that box that ultimately gets food to the table of their of their guests and their friends and then there's also those who feel that they are um you know in a position where they have had members that they cannot risk getting sick and thus need to take the time and and they're treated exactly the same and so i feel very very fortunate about that from our, our company's perspective yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, we've just got a, a couple of minutes left, really. So I think maybe it would be good to do a kind of a, a final thoughts. And so I'd be interested to go around the panel uh, and get your perspectives on, on one final question, which essentially is, you know, what sh how should be companies be thinking about this time in order to position themselves as best as possible after this state of flux is over. And then, Alex, this is something you talked about a lot in terms of the, the optimistic outcomes of this, but what should those priorities be um, to be best positioned kind of post COVID within yeah, this sure. overarching topic? So Alex, maybe I'll start with you and then go around the room. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, and again, I feel very fortunate to work at a company that has a good base uh, of business, you know, in kind of any time of crisis. Um, so speaking from that, I think the, the key there is really to take the opportunity to, I think back to your innovation question, right? It's, it's, I feel very passionate that in our company, we innovate not only for our guests and not only for profit, but most importantly for our team members. So that, you know, as we approach something like this, that as we come out of it, we're, we're accelerating the business and not sort of, you know, realizing that we've solved one problem and we're moving on and back to the business as usual. I think we've learned a ton from this. And so it's how do we take those learnings and, and help make the next, you know, issue more sustainable, more automated, more whatever it is. And so um, I think that's a, that's a key focus for us moving forward, especially as we've now proven that, like I said, business can somewhat go on as usual, whether we're at home in a distribution center or in a store. Um, so I feel good about that. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, and Harshad, perhaps I could get you to, to chip in on this too. You know, how should businesses be positioning themselves to, um, to an extent, to, to paraphrase wins and search or capitalize on this crisis or not let, let this crisis go to waste. It's something that you and I have discussed a few times in the past. And so I'm interested to hear your perspective on what focus should be to, to best position um, post COVID. Yeah, I think uh, what's happening because of COVID-19 and the scale at which uh, it, it's hitting uh, different companies is, is it's uh, 
jolting people out of their usual mindset. So I think uh, that the things that you thought were impossible before, now after a couple of months of experience of innovating almost on a daily basis, people think, uh, people know that uh, they, they can do a lot more. Uh, when they uh, when they put their mental and physical energy behind it, right? So that's that's I think the uh, the most positive outcome that these kind of disruptions are going to happen in future. You are not going to be able to predict everything, but how to get the mental muscle uh, for being agile, uh, flexible, and and fast to to react to it. And there are obviously uh, to to make that happen, there are certain structural changes that need to happen. There are certain uh, technology changes and investment that need to happen, but at least uh, at least this experience uh, is is creating those uh, those leaders that that they believe in now that that we can handle these kind of things and we can flex our muscles. So I'm super excited for for that piece that it's going to empower uh, team members to uh, to to do innovate uh, and, and innovation doesn't necessarily mean a lot of investment. I think it's mostly uh, the mindset and uh, to, to look at the problems differently and, and take that view. So I think that's already happening and I'm excited about that. Fantastic. And, and finally, Pedro, um, what are your thoughts on this? How do you and how would you advise the people and companies you know, attack this time so they're best positioned for the long term? Um, uh, this time and, and always is thinking uh, from outside to the inside. Uh, that is the, the challenge. And uh, I think that we need to have the, the in blood, uh, the thing customer and make, make it happen and making the, the impossible and uh, leaving our, our comfort zone. Uh, as as, as uh, Alex and, uh, and Arsh that said, I think, I think that uh, the answer is, is gathering the, the solutions is a lot of the investment on, uh, on the on technology, uh, on the electronic revolution, gathering projects that were on the draw, that were in pause and bring it uh, at full steam, invest there. Um, and I think that's, that we will uh, be uh, better organizations. I think that we will um, be able to empower our people. I think that uh, we now recognize uh, that uh, our heroes uh, nowadays are different from the heroes that we had before. Um, and at the end, I think that our organizations will be more human organizations. Uh, so as I said in the beginning, I think that is a very strong sentence um, that I get from someone that I cannot recognize that we just realized that our identity is more than a job. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and I think that's a fantastic sentiment almost um, to kind of wrap up this discussion with. Um, we've had so many questions in from the audience, so thanks to everyone for your engagement and apologies if we didn't uh, manage to get to your question. Um, you know, now of all times, the, the importance of sharing ideas in supply chain is is, is heightened, and and for that reason, I'm incredibly grateful um, to the guys who have um, taken time to share their insights and learnings with us all today. So, so a huge thanks from me and from EFT by Reuters events again. Um, the, all the recordings will be shared with everyone in the audience, um, so, so don't feel if you've missed anything, um, they'll come directly to your inbox. Um, and so please do stay tuned for that alongside the rest of our supply chain risk series. Um, but for the time being, thank you again to our panelists, um, and I'll see you all soon. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thanks, thank